We're in a series called Kingdom Come, one of my absolute favorite topics to ever preach on. Because Jesus' prayer and the Lord's prayer, um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is one of my absolute favorite things to pray because I know what my kingdom looks like. And I know what my will to be done looks like. And it never is a beautiful thing at the end of the day. But Jesus' will, our Father's will, our Father's kingdom come, that has the power to change the world. It has the power to change our lives. It has the power to change my life. And that is a beautiful thing. And so as we're in this season where we're praying, God, bring the pastor that you have for us. Bring, bring the person that you have to lead us you know, to the next chapter in our journey. That's um, an amazing prayer. But I think an even better prayer is, even until that person comes, Lord, help us become the kind of family that that embodies your kingdom, that embodies your will. Help us become a people that you get to work through. So that's why we're in this series, and I love it. And I pray that, that that our prayer together is, God, mold us fully into your image. Help us to be to want that, to to seek that, that we are made in the image of Christ. And God, help us to be your tangible presence in our community, you know, in in Algoma, in Sturgeon Bay, in all of the other places that we all live. I don't know them yet, so I'm just going to leave it at those two because I don't get them wrong. Um, Last week I was told, I I even said, is it Kiwani or Kiwani? Yeah, exactly. And then I just heard two different ways, and so we're not going to go there. (laughs) I still don't know. Uh, So today as we talk about the kingdom and what does it look like for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're going to be looking at at a a topic. We're going to be in two different passages of scripture about community. Who are we? Not who am I as a follower of Jesus, but who are we as followers of Jesus? And before we get started, let's pray together. Jesus... We exist for you. This is your church, and we are your people. And while we come here from craziness, crazy lives, all of us running so fast and so hard, I pray that in the next couple of minutes that we are able to hear your voice, that we are willing to listen. And God, I pray that you speak to us, change us and transform us. Because no matter, no matter how we live our lives and no matter what we're seeking, We know that if we seek you and your kingdom, everything else will fall into place. So we're here for you today. Speak to us, and we'll say yes. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, the the message today was just entitled, We Need Each Other. And um, I I became ridiculously aware of this when I was in college. I went to Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach, Florida. We were about a quarter mile from the beach. It was It was tough. It was, it was a rough, rough life. And, um, you know, people were mostly absent because they were at the beach and lost track of time. And, uh, but in, at Palm Beach Atlantic, they had this thing that they no longer have, and I'm going to explain to you why. <laughs> uh, it was called Jan Term. For whatever reason, school, like the, after Christmas break, school started like the first week of February, which was bizarre, because they had this thing called Jan Term. Basically, what you did is you signed up for one class, for January, you went to class about eight hours a day in that one class for, for January, and then at the end of January, you, you were done. Now, as you could imagine, eight hours of class is torture for anybody, including the professor. Very few people took Jan term. My first semester, I'm a fre- I mean, my first year, I'm a freshman. I had no idea of this. I thought, how awesome, get done with a class in a month. I took Jan term. There were eight of us in our class. All of the other ones did not live on campus. So I was, I was there alone. There were so few people, and I like being alone. I mean, it does recharge me. When chaos is going on, being alone can be, you know, just kind of peaceful and nice for me. Being overwhelmed, you know, is kind of detrimental to my soul. So I was like, Jan term is going to be awesome because there's not going to be a lot of people. I plan to read a book a book that I wanted to read. You know, I planned on taking some walks. I planned on watching TV, like whatever I wanted to watch. It was awesome. And I did all of those things on the first day. (laughs) Because 
by day two, I knew we were in trouble. You know, after class, everybody went home. And I'd walk, I'm not kidding, in the whole college, I would walk around campus and I'd like see nobody. The janitor and I were becoming friends, you know? I mean, and I'm like, what are you cleaning? I'm the only one here. Am I that big of a mess? <laughs> I, I ate, I, the cafeteria was huge. I promise you, I'm not kidding. I would be like the only person in the whole cafeteria eating. You know, maybe one person over there. And it, seriously, it was, it was ridiculous. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. I got so lonely, I started talking to myself. I started going to Walmart just to be around people. I'm not kidding. I would walk around. I, I have a feeling that you parents, you know, I was the guy you were telling your kids, stay away from him. He's the creepy man. I think I was him because I was like striking up conversations with people. I have never been so lonely in my life. It was the most miserable month. I think about it all the time. Anytime like chaos is raining, my kids are dragging me in a million different positions and I'm like, ah, I need to be alone. I always think of Jan term and I'm like, the chaos is not that bad. <laughs> I, it's okay. So I'm curious. I, I want to know, how many of you, you kind of lean towards being introverted? You, you get recharged when you're, when you're by yourself. Crowds kind of, you know, drain you a little bit. How, how many of you would say you're more introverted? Okay, a good number. How about, how many of you are more, you know, extroverted? You love being in a crowd. You're like, woo! <laughs> I know. Okay. So, what, I find it interesting. See, those who are introverts cannot imagine getting recharged by being in a crowd. You just can't even imagine it. You're like, I like being alone. I, 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 need, I need time for me. And being, being by yourself is really comfortable. But the extroverts, you're, you're the same way. You're like, I can't imagine being alone and this being a good thing. Like, I can't imagine being recharged by being alone. My wife still makes fun of me because every once in a while I'll be like, honey, I need to go see a movie by myself. She's like, what are you talking about? I love going to see movies by myself. She's like, I can't imagine a worse day than going to the movies by myself. But what's, so, you know, you, and you ask the question, who do you think, and you don't have to answer, but who do you think would be better at community, introverts or extroverts? You know, and I would, pro I would have leaned, and, you know, maybe extroverts because you guys do crowds and stuff like that, but what I have found over the years is that neither of us are very good at community because introverts, you know, we find it easy to be by ourselves, and we, we like it. We, we, we don't want to, we're uncomfortable in lots of crowds. But extroverts, you find it often easy to be in a crowd and to kind of be anonymous in the groups of people, and you kind of get lost. But real community, it isn't easy, and it is very uncomfortable. It is, isn't safe. I think that community is best described by words like messy, uncomfortable, selfless, vulnerable. You're like, who wants that? And I really think the answer is everybody. I really do. I think that everybody desires community as messy as it is because I think that we were designed that way. We were designed by God for community. See, I'm, a, I'm kind of like in the middle, but I lean towards introvert. Yet you stick me by myself in a January term for a whole month, and it's the worst month of my life when it comes to, like, my emotional state. It, it was so bad for me. Communities, they, they do so much for us. We were designed for them. They provide identity. I mean, so this is something that's desperately needed in our culture. Who am I? Who do I belong with? What, what kind of person am I? In communities, they also provide wisdom and direction when you're going through major transition. I mean, you think about teenagers who are graduating high school and... Where do they get their wise advice about where to go? I mean, because they don't know. I, I was like a junior before I even declared a major. Because I, I, I did because my advisor's like, uh, you have to declare a major by now. I had no idea. Who, who do you go to? Communities provide that kind of wisdom. Communities provide help and perspective as we go through crisis. They're, they're, they're where we experience healing and forgiveness and where we get to extend forgiveness. Most of us, you know, even when we're surrounded by good people, 
we hide what's really going on. And we don't foster relationships that are vulnerable. And we don't give others permission, you know, to speak into our lives and tell us the hard, hard stuff and all the messed up stuff. And let's, you know, let's be honest. We all have messed up lives, right? I mean, can we just admit that together and say, yeah, we all have some messed up areas. I mean, hopefully we're not complete messes, but we're, I'm a pretty good mess. And if you ever want to know about it, let me know and I'll just tell you and you'll go, I don't think you should be our pastor anymore. And um, <laughs> because we're all so messed up. We are. We are. So the kingdom life that we're praying for, it's designed by God and it's designed for us to do it together. And so, you know, as we talk about kingdom come, your will be done, know that for that to happen, that means we have to do it together. It's not easy because we do disagree and we do fight. But that's also why we have reconciliation and why we get to experience that together. Community, in community, and those of you who know this, maybe you have been in community, it, it can hurt and you can be betrayed you can be hurt deeply, and it's true. But in community, that is where we also get to experience forgiveness. You can't, be, you can't be forgiven if you haven't done something wrong. And you can't experience the act of forgiving unless somebody has done something wrong to you. See, I mean, when Jesus says to forgive people, he's saying, assume you're going to be hurt. When he says love people, he's saying, assume people are going to try to take advantage of you because... You don't tell somebody to love somebody if it's already becoming natural. I don't tell my kids they have to love each other because they do it easily. You know, I mean, they fight and I'm like, tell your sister that you love her. And they're like, no, do you want your iPad or my iPad or whatever? (laughs) Tell your sister, I love you. I wouldn't have to tell her to do that if there wasn't a problem. There's a problem. See, so community life is, uh, or kingdom life is community life. And as we delve into the Bible this morning, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture. One is Jesus' desire for us, for this community. But the other one we're going to look at is, okay, so what what did the early church do to live out that community? Now, a couple of weeks ago, we we did see Jesus' heart for community in the Lord's Prayer. And we said that Jesus told us to pray, our Father in heaven. He didn't say my father. He didn't say your father. He said our father because it's never about me, Don. It is always about we, us. It's really strange. Almost every single time in scripture where you see the word you, like there's a command, um, you know, you do this, you do that, or if you do this, God will bless you. Almost every single time it is not a single, singular you. It, in the Bible, the, the worldview of the Bible is so, so community-oriented that in their language, they had a different word for you as a person and you as a group. Unfortunately, in English, we don't have that. So when, when you see in the Bible, you know, that God wants you to do this or God, God is there for you, we're always thinking for me, oh good, God's there for me. But that's not what it's saying at all. It's saying God is there for you as a people, you all. And so the South kind of has something right. It's y'all. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Hey, don't get on to me. I'm just quoting the Bible. It's y'all. And so um, it's never about me because we, y'all are God's family. We're all God's family. His kingdom come. His will be done. It happens with us. And, it's, it's, and not only does it happen with us and to us, it happens through us because it is through the community that God lets the people in the world know that he loves them. It doesn't happen through Don. It happens through Lakeside. It happens through the corporate community of followers of Jesus, us. It happens when we're together and we pursue God together. So let's look at this... Um, this passage of scripture, we're going to be in, in John. And um, because it, you see in this passage that when we are the community of God, praying your kingdom come, your will be done, and actually doing something about it, acting that way, that you can see a small expression of what the kingdom is supposed to be like in our midst. And I'll be honest, that's my goal. I want, I want people to visit Lakeside. And go, I've never experienced anything like that. 
Those people love each other. There's something special there. And I want people, to, you know, when lakesiders are around our, our, our Lutheran brothers and sisters or our Catholic brothers and sisters or whatever denominations are around here, whatever other churches, and when we're together, people on the outside go, I, I didn't know that different denominations even liked each other. But they're acting like brothers and sisters because we're one family. That's what, I want, that's what I want to see happen. I think that's what it looks like in Algoma when his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in John 17, Jesus says this most amazing prayer. It's like one of those prayers where you go, if you ever want to know, I, I don't know how to pray. This is a whole chapter. It's one prayer by Jesus to the Father. And he starts, uh, it's mostly about unity. He prays about his relationship with his Father. And then he prays about his relationship with his disciples. And this is where we're going to start in 17, chapter 17, verse 11. Jesus said, to the Father, I, I will remain in the world no longer. So I'm about to die, he says. But they, my disciples, are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Father. So Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me so that they may be, so that they may be one as we are one. I mean, so think about this. Jesus knows he's about to die. His disciples are clueless at this point. But he knows he's going, he's, he's, he's dying. And he's no longer going to be with them to protect them. And so he, he prays, Father, protect them. And kind of like that song that I was talking about at the beginning. He doesn't say, Father, protect them from persecution. Because he knew they were going to be persecuted. He even let them know that they're going to be persecuted. But he didn't say, protect them from persecution. He didn't say, protect them from pain and suffering, knowing that they were going to experience those things. He said, look at the last sentence, the last line. Protect them for one purpose, that they may be one as we are one. In the same way the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, yet three. May my people be many, my followers, may they be many, Yet in the same way, may they be one. Wow. And then Jesus goes even farther, which I, this one, I just got chills. That's really weird. It blows me away because Jesus in that moment knows that his, this movement of Jesus' followers isn't stopping with him and his immediate followers. Because he says in verse 20, my prayer is not for my, these followers alone, you know, the 12 and all the other people who are following. It's not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe, future, who will believe in me through their message. So they're going to go and they're going to share this message and people all over the world are going to begin believing. And I want to pray for them too, Jesus says, that all of them may be what? One. One. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then he continues. Let me just read the, the next couple of verses. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I mean, this is a lot of ones. God, help them be one, be one, be one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me so that they may, brought, they may be brought to complete unity. And then this is, to me, I mean, ah. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. We are united with God. We are in the process of being united together as one body. And this unity means that the world will know. I mean, the unity of our, our fellowship, the, the way we are bound together as one body. And he's not talking about Lakeside. He's talking about the church which I'll talk about in a second, but this body, it is through us united that the world will know that, Je that Jesus is Lord. Yet we do life so separate. We are running all the time and we come together for Sunday and then we run and do our own thing and then we come together for Sunday. And when, when Jesus talks about unity here, he's not talking about that we agree on everything because that will never happen. My wife and I are unified we don't agree on everything. I'm hoping that I'm not the only one. But I saw some heads go up and down, so I know that it's not just us. 
you know, but the thing is, we can be completely in disagreement about something. And it can be about important things, raising our kids or, you know, where we're going to go for dinner, which is one of our biggest things. I don't know, that's weird. But we can be completely, have disagreement, but be unified that I, I back you. I'm on your team. It doesn't matter what's going on or what our disagreements are. We are one family in spite of the disagreements. So as a church, we... This is tough, but theology is not what unites us as a church. The way we believe does not unite us. I mean, those are good things, and so denominations will revolve around certain secondary issues, and that's okay. But what unites us is one thing. We follow Jesus Christ, period. That is why the Lutherans and the Catholics and the non-denominational and the Baptists and the Presbyterians, and we, we call ourselves the body of Christ, not as different denominations, but together because we follow Jesus Christ. He uses the one united community to participate with him to redeem and restore and transform the world. That is what he means by his kingdom come and his will be done. But it is so hard. It is so much easier to do life alone. My wife and I, we, we led a small group in uh, Sun Prairie for over a year. And this group was becoming so tight and so close. I mean, we so much so that on Christmas Eve, we had like Christmas Eve communion together because our church wasn't doing anything on that, that Christmas Eve. And so we all, my small group met together on Christmas Eve. Who goes to their, their small group on Christmas Eve? All of us. Everybody was there. It was beautiful. And so, I mean, we were getting really close. And then as we were meeting together, out of the blue, one of the couples mentions that they're getting a divorce. And I mean, you know, we knew there were issues because we were a small group and we were sharing stuff, but nobody in the group had any idea that divorce was even on the table. Now, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of hurt. I'm like, how could I not know this? I asked them, and I was like, well, what's going on? What happened? Why didn't you share how things were getting. And, and he said to me, he goes, well, we figure those things are private and we don't want to air our dirty laundry our, uh, with anybody but family. And I remember thinking, we're family. This is your family. We're not just a bunch of people who meet together on a Wednesday night or whatever. We're family. We walk together. We, we go through, we, we share our dirty laundry together because that's what family does. Through good and through bad, we're here for each other. Oh, I was like, you, you missed out. I, if he would have shared, would, would they have still got divorced? I don't know. But I do know this. They wouldn't have had to go through it together or separately by themselves. They would have been able to go through it with some people who loved them and who weren't judging them. They're our family. We wanted to walk through their life, good and bad. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be having to do it alone. I know community's hard, and I know it's messy. It's always messy. But it's, it can, it's absolutely beautiful, too. When you're going through crisis and you have somebody with you who doesn't judge you, and maybe it's a crisis of your own doing, or maybe it's something that happened to you, you have people walking through it with you, there's nothing beautiful, more beautiful. After Jesus' death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes down and, on this community of believers, and like 3,000 people come to follow Jesus in one day. And you think about that, that day. Because all of a sudden, you have this diverse community of believers. You have you know, Jews, Greeks, Romans, Africans. You have Pharisees, prostitutes, tax collectors, fishermen, people who were involved in cults, teachers. You have all of these people coming together as a community, uh, following Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and whose lives began being transformed together. Jesus' followers, they did not see themselves as independent. They saw themselves as interdependent. They were dependent together. See, that's what God's family is. In, in the Bible, it's as people who speak English, we kind of got a, a raw deal on something. Every time you see the word church in the Bible, it comes from a word called ecclesia. Unfortunately, the word ecclesia is not normally translated church. Like, ecclesia was not a spiritual word. It was a Roman word that meant gathering. When a city would get together to vote on something, 
It was an ecclesia. It was just a typical word. And when Jesus started using the word, you know, Peter, on this rock, I will build my ecclesia, what happened is around the year 300, 400-ish, as uh, in, in the German world, as they were translating, they translated kirch, which became church. It became such an integral part that every time we see ecclesia, even in English now, we translate it church instead of gathering. And the bad part is that when we think of church, what do we think of? A building. But if I say the word gathering, do you think of building? No. That's been the problem, is that every time you see the word church in Scripture, you think of a different thing than what Jesus and the apostles thought of, because they, all they meant, it meant gathering. That's what the word means. So every, every time that church is mentioned in the Bible, it's never talking about a building or a worship service. It's never talking about an individual or a place. It's always talking about a gathering of people. And sometimes it's talking about like the global community because what they viewed, just like the Jewish people did, that if you were a follower of Jesus, you lived in Spain or Rome or Israel or wherever, it didn't matter. You were part of the ecclesia of Jesus, the gathering of Jesus. And then there were local gatherings where you'd meet in a house. And so this is your local ecclesia. That is part of the worldwide ecclesia, gathering. So you ha- and, and with this ecclesia, you have its start with a promise by Jesus. And again, we often read this singular, but look at it plural. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But how different is it when I say, you all will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes? Not you, y'all. And you all will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The emphasis is on us, not me. The church, the ecclesia, is us, not Lakeside's building. Not Don the pastor, the interim pastor, not your future pastor, not any one person, not any two or three people. It is us, all of us. From the very beginning, it has always been about all of us. So, what does that kind of community look like? That's where I want to spend the rest of our time together, which is not a lot of time. The early Christians were so diverse. How could they become a family? And it wasn't easy. Read Paul's letters. There were lots of messes. And they, they could not figure out tons. They struggled just like we do. Probably more. But regardless of their differences... Let's look at a couple of things they did. It says in Acts 2 that all of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they came together to hear the word of God and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. See, this was a choice, and they chose to devote themselves together. And it says in verse 43 that a deep sense of awe came over them all. They knew this was holy ground, not because of the location, but because we are together and Jesus is in our midst. So they, there was a sense of awe. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Did they have to? No, nobody was making them. They knew each other's stories so much. They knew the needs so much that it was like, absolutely. They, and they, they would sell their land or they'd sell their stuff because they're like, I have, you don't, let's have together. And that was just the way that it was. They, sh- they chose to share their lives together and meet each other's needs. And then the last passage. And it says they, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. I love this picture. So they, they went to church together. They went to the location, the temple. And then they would, they would have, in homes, they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. They would take communion, and they would remember what Jesus did, that the Messiah had come, and he had sacrificed himself for them. And it says they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, so they ate together and fellowshiped, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day, as a result of all of that, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I mean, this passage represents the earliest Christian community, again, of prostitutes, tax collectors, Pharisees, teachers, 
fishermen. I mean, what a ridiculously diverse group of people all coming together in this Christian community. You know, and you look at it, in life, it was lived together. It didn't matter what race or what background you had, what your economic status was. They all lived together. And they were shaped by the teachings of Jesus. What's amazing is, I mean, this passage was before any of this was written down. So they were recalling, and, you know, Peter would say, I remember when Jesus said this. And, and, and they were sharing the message of Jesus as they were hearing it, and it was just transforming their lives. They were eating with each other, taking communion together, and they were praying together. And, and I love the awe. And they were continually in awe of what God was doing in their midst, sharing time and resources with each other. And I love it. And always, always, always welcoming those on the outside and inviting them to be a part of their community. Not saying change first, behave first, believe correctly before you're allowed in. But no, 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 no. We exist. Why, why does the ecclesia exist? Is it for us? No. No. Your kingdom come, your will be done in us as it is in heaven. It is about him and his purpose. And what is his purpose? We can go back to Genesis 12, which I have like every week. (laughs) The promise to Abraham that he will be a blessing to the world. We exist to be a blessing for those who are on the outside to say, Jesus wants to restore you too. Ah, It's a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture. But it is so foreign to most of us. We don't do community well. I mean, we're, we're Americans. <laughs> we're Americans. We're individuals. We like to do it our way. And so we like to think of the community as the, the ecclesia as Sunday morning, the building where we meet. And I, I, I wonder, do I tell you this? Do I share this? Of course, yes. Um, I love you. This isn't community. I'm sorry. It is a gathering. But this isn't community. This is a service. It's a beautiful service. It's a crowd. This is like a big family reunion. We come, we celebrate, we worship, we have amazing times together. This is like the time in that Acts passage where they go to the temple. We're not the temple, of course, but uh, that was destroyed a long time ago. But we come together and, and worship and celebrate, and it is beautiful. But I don't think any of us in here would use words like intimate. I don't think any of us would use words like messy unless I do something stupid up here like fall down, which I've done, or, you know, trip or whatever. You you wouldn't use the word vulnerable. The church, and you know this, the church was never meant to be a one-hour service. It was never meant to do that. I, I love our Sundays together, and this was never meant to be the entire expression of the ecclesia. It's, it was always meant to be a part, but this isn't it. Sundays are a place where we come and worship and celebrate and have fun together, talk together, drink coffee in the lobby, which, again, I love our lobby, and and we get to welcome people into the family. I love to call this the kind of place where you can invite somebody to come kick the tires on Christianity, see if we're, you know, as weird as, you, you know, the television shows portray us, or if we're just a bunch of normal people who love each other and want to do God's work. So community is about doing life together, and I don't know if any of us would call this life. Does the rest of your week look like this? You know? Because <laughs> mine, I wish. Thank you. <laughs> me too. I love lots of people listening to me. You know? <laughs> no, this isn't, this isn't what the week looks like. We can't be known in here. <clears throat> that is why, as churches, we have small groups. Because that is a place where you can get to know people. Does it happen right away? Not in my world. Shoot, we were together for a year and somebody got divorced and we didn't even know about it. But it is a place where if you choose to, you can begin to do life with other people. You can meet some new people. You can get to know them. That is why we do things like a chili cook-off. I know, you think it's about the chili. It's not. It's about a place where we can come together and get to know each other and be family. Do you do life together in a chili cook-off? Maybe some ways that we don't want to do, but... (laughs) When we're, when we're doing a chili cook-off together, what happens is people who never have met each other have a chance to talk. And who knows what will happen when that happens. It's people who have never been to church go, I don't want to go to Sunday, but I do like me some chili. And all of a sudden they go and go, these people aren't as crazy as I thought. Nobody was preaching at me. In fact, everybody just kept shoving chili in my face, shoving chili in my face. 
So that is why we do those kind of events, because it's opportunities to get to know each other. That's why we do ministry here in teams. We have a team who work, you know, works on the, in the children's department. We have a team of elders. We have a team of people. I mean, this morning I come in with the coffee and there's like four people behind the counter and everybody's talking and I'm like, that is ecclesia. That is beautiful. The service is just an hour where you're quiet and I'm talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the rest of the time, honestly, I think the lobby after and before the service is probably just as important, maybe more important, than this, because that is where we're doing life together, and we want to do that more and more. <clears throat> Community is where we find out what our blind spots are and how to fix them. Just yesterday, gosh, it was yesterday, somebody cut me ba- off bad in the car. I mean, like, I thought they were going to cause a wreck. It was really bad, and then as the guy passed me, he gave me that look like, that's right, I did it. I mean, I... I told my daughter, Allie, she's in the car with me, 15 years old, and I'm like, I want to get behind him and just lay on the horn and drive behind him. And she goes, Dad, you have a problem. (laughs) She did. She goes, Dad, this is not okay. And I was like, it convicted me. Well, she's right, because I really did want to do that. I was angry at the guy's eyes. And, um, and, but I knew she was right. And I was like, you know, that's going to be good for the message, because that's what community does. It's people telling you what you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. Who does that in your life? Is there anybody in your life who will challenge you? Oh, somebody is saying yes. (laughs) Oh, good. See, you are blessed to have a community. He's like, that's my mom. She's paid to do that. Um, Yeah, I mean, who in your life asks you how your marriage is doing? For real. Who in your life says, when was the last time you spent quality time with God? How are you doing with whatever addiction you're trying to overcome? How are you doing um, with your work? Are you working too much? How are you doing as a parent? Are you getting angry all the time? See, in America, we don't have community usually who can get into our mix like that. And, and sometimes our spouse is scared to because, they, you know, I have to live with this person. <laughs> we need people in our lives who can challenge us. Do you have somebody like that? If not, see... Start looking for and pursuing the relationships. Go to the chili kickoff. Not to eat chili, but to say, I'm going to get to know somebody. Join a small group. Join a ministry team. Come a little bit early and hang out in the lobby. Even if you're by yourself with your cup of coffee, look around for somebody else who's by themselves and go say hi. It's hard in America to do this. I know. It doesn't mean we shouldn't. We need to look for relationships. Last story. I was in a big church. There was a guy who uh, I found out had attended for seven years. Seven years. Never was in a small group. Never served on a team. Never really tried to get to know anybody. But he was very faithful. He came every Sunday. One day he had a heart attack. Goes to the hospital. While he's in the hospital, he gets an infection and he's there for almost two weeks. Almost dies. When he went into the hospital, the pastor was on vacation. Nobody even knew the guy went to the hospital. He gets out. He calls the pastor. He says, I'm leaving the church. Pastor says, why? Guy says, I was in the hospital for two weeks. Nobody ever once visited me. See, that story breaks my heart. Because that guy, he's blaming the church, yet nobody knew him. Nobody knew who he was. Because you can come to a church and sit in a pew, what is this, 1975? (laughs) Sit in a chair in a church and never be known. Because this this isn't community, this isn't vulnerability, this is a crowd and it's a beautiful crowd. It has to go further. I, I rack my brain going for that guy. How could the church have done anything different? We didn't know him. We... Our church, we had small groups, we had teams, everything was in team. We, we emphasized it all the time. He just didn't participate. I don't know what we could have done different. I want to. Breaks my heart. He should not have been alone. Community, it exists to help us grow and to be more like Jesus for his kingdom to come. It helps us in crisis. See, we are not designed to do life alone. We do need each other. It's not about buildings and music and messages. It's about love and intimacy 
in caring for each other and serving each other and forgiving each other and asking for forgiveness. That's what it's all about. Now, for 2,000 years, one of the most significant ways the church has celebrated community is an event that we often do. Some churches do it every week. Some churches do it quarterly, whatever. But it's called communion. It is a time where we take bread and we take juice or wine and when we eat them, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we could be right with God, so that we could be a community. We're going to take communion in just a minute. But c- communion, it, it is above our beliefs. It is above our traditions and our doctrines. It is the whole family of Jesus uniting together to say, we are an ecclesia, a gathering for one purpose, Jesus We can disagree in all the little things. We are one people in Jesus. God became man so that we could be right with God. God lived a perfect life. Jesus died on the cross, rose again. His blood was spilt that the world might be right. And when we eat that bread, we remember his his body broken. When we we drink that juice, we remember his blood spilt. So I want to ask you before we take communion this morning, Are you part of God's community? The band's going to come up and we're going to pray in just a minute, but I want to ask, have you chosen to follow Jesus? Are you part of his family, his ecclesia? Because that's the first step. He loves you. He is pursuing you. He invites you to be a part of his family. Not whatever picture you have of the church. No, no. It's about family you are invited to be a part of family. So as I pray in just a second, I want to invite you to submit your life to God, to be part of his family, so that when you take communion, you are taking it not as an individual who is eating some bread and drinking some juice. You are taking it as, a, as part of a family who remembers the sacrifice that God has made for us as well as for me. Let's pray together. Jesus, I want to thank you that you desire your people to be a family because we do need each other. And and God, I know that there are people in in a crowd this size, inevitably there are people who don't know you. They've never chosen to cross that line and to say, I can't do it on my own. I need God. I pray right now that you give them the courage to allow you to be their God rather than them being their own God. Lord, I pray that you help them to say yes to you. And if you're here, (laughs) and that is you, just tell him, God, I cannot do it on my own. I want to follow you. Because of your death and your resurrection, I want to be a follower of Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.